The Zen Teaching of Huang Po on the Transmission of Mind, translated by John Blofeld. Part 1. The Chen Zhao Record of the Zen Master Huang Po, a collection of sermons and dialogues recorded by Pei Xi while in the city of Chen Zhao. The Master said to me, All the Buddhas and all sentient beings are nothing but the one mind besides which nothing exists. This mind, which is without beginning, is unborn and indestructible. It is not green nor yellow, and has neither form nor appearance. It does not belong to the categories of things which exist or do not exist, nor can it be thought of in terms of new or old. It is neither long nor short, big nor small, for it transcends all limits, measures, names, traces, and comparisons. It is that which you see before you. Begin to reason about it, and you at once fall into error. It is like the boundless void which cannot be fathomed or measured. The one mind alone is the Buddha, and there is no distinction between the Buddha and sentient things, but that sentient beings are attached to forms, and so seek externally for Buddhahood. By their very seeking they lose it, for that is using the Buddha to seek for the Buddha and using mind to grasp mind. Even though they do their utmost for a full aeon, they will not be able to attain it. They do not know that if they put a stop to conceptual thought and forget their anxiety, the Buddha will appear before them. For this mind is the Buddha, and the Buddha is all living beings. It is not the less for being manifested in ordinary beings, nor it is greater for being manifested in the Buddhas. As to performing the six paramitas and vast numbers of similar practices, or gaining merits as countless as the sands of the Ganges, since you are fundamentally complete in every respect, you should not try to supplement that perfection by such meaningless practices. When there is occasion for them, perform them, and when the occasion is past, remain questioned. If you are not absolutely convinced that the mind is the Buddha, and if you are attached to forms, practices, and meritorious performances, your way of thinking is false and quite incompatible with the way. The mind is the Buddha, nor are there any other Buddhas or any other mind. It is bright and spotless as the void, having no form or appearance whatever. To make use of your minds to think conceptually is to leave the substance and attach yourself to form. The ever-existing Buddha is not a Buddha of form or attachment. To practice the six paramitas and a myriad similar practices with the intention of becoming a Buddha thereby is to advance by stages, but the ever-existent Buddha is not a Buddha of stages. Only awake to the one mind, and there is nothing whatsoever to be attained. This is the real Buddha. The Buddha and all sentient beings are the one mind and nothing else. Mind is like the void in which there is no confusion or evil, as when the sun wheels through it shining upon the four corners of the world. For, when the sun rises and illuminates the whole earth, the void gains not in brilliance, and when the sun sets, the void does not darken. The phenomena of light and dark alternate with each other, but the nature of the void remains unchanged. So it is with the mind of the Buddha and of sentient beings. If you look upon the Buddha as presenting a pure, bright, or enlightened appearance, or upon sentient beings as presenting a foul, dark, or mortal-seeming appearance, these conceptions resulting from attachment to form will keep you from supreme knowledge, even after the passing of as many aeons as there are sands in the Ganges. There is only the one mind, and not a particle of anything else on which to lay hold, for this mind is the Buddha. If you students of the way do not awake to this mind substance, you will overlay mind with conceptual thought, you will seek the Buddha outside yourselves, and you will remain attached to forms, pious practices, and so on, all of which are harmful and not at all the way to supreme knowledge. Making offerings to all the Buddhas of the universe is not equal to making offerings to one follower of the way who has eliminated conceptual thought. Why? because such a one forms no concepts whatsoever. The substance of the absolute is inwardly like wood or stone, in that it is motionless and outwardly like the void, in that it is without bounds or obstructions. It is neither subjective nor objective, has no specific location, is formless and cannot vanish. 
those who hasten towards it dare not enter, fearing to hurtle down through the void with nothing to cling to or stay their fall. So they look to the brink and retreat. This refers to all those who seek such a goal through cognition. Thus, those who seek the goal through cognition are like the fur, many, while those who obtain intuitive knowledge of the way are like the horns, few. Manjushri represents fundamental law and samatabhadra activity. By the former is meant the law of the real and unbounded void, and by the latter the inexhaustible activities beyond the sphere of form. Avalokitesvara represents boundless compassion, Mahastama, great wisdom, and Vimalakirti, spotless name. Spotless refers to the real nature of things, while name means form. Yet form is really one with real nature, hence the combined term spotless name. All the qualities typified by the great bodhisattvas are inherent in men and are not to be separated from the one mind. Awake to it, and it is there. You students of the way who do not awake to this in your own minds, and who are attached to the appearances or seek for something objective outside your own minds, all have turned your backs on the way. The sands of the Ganges. The Buddha said of these sands, If all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas with Indra and all the gods walk across them, the sands do not rejoice. And if oxen, sheep, Reptiles and insects tread upon them, the sands are not angered. For jewels and perfumes they have no longing, and for the stinking filth of manure and urine they have no loathing. This mind is no mind of conceptual thought, and is completely detached from form. So Buddhas and sentient beings do not differ at all. If you can only rid yourselves of conceptual thought, you will have accomplished everything. But if you students of the way do not rid yourself of conceptual thought in a flash, even though you strive for aeon after aeon, you will never accomplish it. Enmeshed in meritorious practices of the three vehicles, you will be unable to attain enlightenment. Nevertheless, the realization of the one mind may come after a shorter or a longer period. There are those who, upon hearing this teaching, rid themselves of conceptual thought in a flash. There are others who do this after following through the ten beliefs, the ten stages, and ten activities, and the ten bestowals of merit. Yet others accomplish it after passing through the ten stages of a bodhisattva's progress. But whether they transcend conceptual thought by a longer or a shorter way, the result is a state of being. There is no pious practicing and no action of realizing. That there is nothing which can be attained is not idle talk. It is the truth. Moreover, whether you accomplish your aim in a single flash of thought or after going through the ten stages of a bodhisattva's progress, the achievement will be the same. For this state of being admits of no degrees, so the latter method merely entails aeons of unnecessary suffering and toil. The building up of good and evil both involve attachment to form. Those who, being attached to form, do evil have to undergo various incarnations unnecessarily, while those who, being attached to form, do good subject themselves to toil and privation equally to no purpose. In either case, it is better to achieve sudden self-realization and to grasp the fundamental dharma. This dharma is mind, beyond which there is no dharma, and this mind is the dharma beyond which there is no mind. Mind in itself is not mind, Yet neither is it no mind. To say that mind is no mind implies something existent. Let there be a silent understanding and no more. Away with all thinking and explaining. Then we may say that the way of the words has been cut off and movements of the mind eliminated. This mind is the pure Buddha source inherent in all men. All wrigglings being possessed of sentient life and all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are of this one substance and do not differ. Differences arise from wrong thinking only and lead to the creation of all kinds of karma. Our original Buddha nature is, in highest truth, devoid of any atom of objectivity. It is void, omnipresent, silent, pure. It is glorious and mysterious, peaceful joy, and that is all. Enter deeply into it by awakening to yourself. That which is before you is it, in all its fullness, utterly complete. There is naught beside. 
Even if you go through all the stages of Bodhisattva's progress towards Buddhahood one by one, when at last in a single flash you attain to full realization, you will only be realizing the Buddha nature which has been with you all the time, and by all the foregoing stages you will have added to it nothing at all. You will come to look upon these aeons of work and achievements as no better than unreal actions performed in a dream. That is why the Tathagata said, I truly attained nothing from complete unexcelled enlightenment. Had there been anything attained, Dipamkara Buddha would not have made the prophecy concerning me. He also said, This Dharma is absolutely without distinctions, neither high nor low, and its name is Bodhi. It is pure mind, which is the source of everything, and which, whether appearing as sentient beings or as Buddhas, as the rivers and mountains of the world which has form, and that which is formless or is penetrating the whole universe, is absolutely without distinctions, there being no such entities as selfness and otherness. This pure mind, the source of everything, shines forever and on with the brilliance of its own perfection. But the people of the world do not awake to it, regarding only that which sees, hears, feels, and knows as mind. Blinded by their own sight, hearing, feeling, and knowing, they do not perceive the spiritual brilliance of the source substance. If they would only eliminate all conceptual thought in a flash, that source substance would manifest itself like the sun ascending through the void and illuminating the whole universe without hindrance or bounds. Therefore, few students of the way seek to progress through seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing. When you are deprived of your perceptions, your way to mind will be cut off and you will find nowhere to enter. Only realize that, though real mind is expressed in these perceptions, it neither forms parts of them nor is separate from them. You should not start reasoning from these perceptions nor allow them to give rise to conceptual thought. Yet nor should you seek the one mind apart from them or abandon them in your pursuit of the Dharma. Do not keep them, nor abandon them, nor dwell in them, nor cleave to them. Above, below, and around you, all is spontaneously existing, for there is nowhere which is outside the Buddha mind. When the people of the world hear it said that the Buddhas transmit the doctrine of the mind, they suppose that there is something to be attained or realized apart from mind, and thereupon they use mind to seek the Dharma, not knowing that mind and the object of their search are one. Mind cannot be used to seek something from mind, for then, after the passing of millions of aeons, the day of success will still not have dawned. Such a method is not to be compared with suddenly eliminating conceptual thought, which is the fundamental dharma. Suppose a warrior, forgetting that he was already wearing his pearl on his forehead, were to seek for it elsewhere. He could travel the whole world without finding it. But if someone who knew what was wrong were to point it out to him, the warrior would immediately realize that the pearl had been there the whole time. So if you students of the way are mistaken about your own real mind, not recognizing that it is the Buddha, you will consequently look for him elsewhere, indulging in various achievements and practices as expecting to attain realization by such graduated practices. But even after aeons of diligent searching, you will not be able to attain to the way. These methods cannot be compared to the sudden elimination of conceptual thought in the certain knowledge that there is nothing at all which has absolute existence, nothing on which to lay hold, nothing on which to rely, nothing in which to abide, nothing subjective or objective. It is by preventing the rise of conceptual thought that you will realize Bodhi, and when you do, you will just be realizing the Buddha who has always existed in your own mind. Aeons of striving will prove to be so much wasted effort, just as, when the warrior found his pearl, he merely discovered what had been hanging on his forehead the whole time, and just as his finding of it had nothing to do with his efforts to discover it elsewhere. Therefore the Buddha said, I truly attained nothing from complete unexcelled enlightenment. It was for fear that people would not believe this that he drew upon what is seen with the five sorts of vision and spoken with the five kind of speech. So this quotation is by no means empty talk, but expresses the highest truth. 
Students of the way should be sure that the four elements composing the body do not constitute the self, that the self is not an entity, and that it can be deduced from this that the body is neither self nor entity. Moreover, the five aggregates composing the mind, in the common sense, do not constitute either a self or an entity. Hence, it can be deduced that the so-called individual mind is neither self nor entity. The six sense organs, including the brain, which, together with their six types of perception and the six kinds of objects of perception, constitute the sensory world, must be understood in the same way. Those eighteen aspects of sense are separately and together void. There is only mind source, limitless in extent of the absolute purity. Thus there is sensual eating and wise eating. When the body composed of the four elements suffers the pangs of hunger, and accordingly you provide it with food, but without greed, that is called wise eating. On the other hand, if you gluttonously delight in purity and flavor, you are permitting the distinctions which arise from wrong thinking. Merely seeking to gratify the organ of taste without realizing when you have taken enough is called sensual eating. Sravakas reach enlightenment by hearing the Dharma, so they are called Sravakas. Sravakas do not comprehend their own mind, but allow concepts to arise from listening to the doctrine. Whether they hear of the existence of Bodhi and Nirvana through supernormal powers or good fortune or preaching, they will attain to Buddhahood only after three aeons of infinitely long duration. All these belong to the way of the Sravakas, so they are called Sravaka Buddhas. But to awaken suddenly to the fact that your own mind is the Buddha, that there is nothing to be attained or a single action to be performed, this is the supreme way. This is really to be as a Buddha. It is only to be feared that you students of the way, by the coming into existence of a single thought, may raise a barrier between yourselves and the way. From thought instant to thought instant, no form. From thought instant to thought instant, no activity. That is to be a Buddha. If you students of the way wish to become Buddhas, you need study no doctrines whatsoever. But learn only how to avoid seeking for and attaching yourselves to anything. Where nothing is sought, this implies mind unborn. Where no attachments exist, this implies mind not destroyed. And that which is neither born nor destroyed is the Buddha. The 84,000 methods for countering the 84,000 forms of delusion are merely figures of speech for drawing people towards the gate. In fact, none of them have real existence. Relinquishment of everything is the Dharma, and he who understands this is a Buddha. But the relinquishment of all delusions leaves no Dharma on which to lay hold. If you students of the way desire knowledge of this great mystery, only avoid attachment to any single thing beyond mind. To say that the real Dharmakaya of the Buddha resembles the void is another way of saying that the Dharmakaya is the void and that the void is the Dharmakaya. People often claim that the Dharmakaya is in the void and that the void contains the Dharmakaya, not realizing that they are one and the same. But if you define the void as something existing, then it is not the Dharmakaya. And if you define the Dharmakaya as something existing, then it is not the void. Only refrain from any objective conception of the void, then it is the Dharmakaya. And if you only refrain from the objective conception of the Dharmakaya, why, then it is the void. These two do not differ from each other. Nor is there any difference between sentient beings and Buddhas, or between samsara and nirvana, or between delusion and bodhi. When all such forms are abandoned, there is the Buddha. Ordinary people look to their surroundings while followers of the way look to the mind, but the true dharma is to forget them both. The former is easy enough, the latter very difficult. Men are afraid to forget their minds, fearing to fall through the void with nothing to stay their fall. They do not know that the void is not really void, but the realm of the real dharma. The spiritually enlightening nature is without beginning, as ancient as the void, subject neither to birth nor to destruction, neither existing nor not existing, neither impure nor pure, neither clamorous nor silent, neither old nor young, occupying no space, having neither inside nor outside, size nor form, color nor sound. 
It cannot be looked for or sought, comprehended by wisdom or knowledge, explained in words, contacted materially, or reached by meritorious achievements. All the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, together with all wriggling things possessed of life, share in this great nirvanic nature. This nature is mind, mind is the Buddha, and the Buddha is the Dharma. Any thought apart from this truth is entirely a wrong thought. You cannot use mind to seek mind, the Buddha to seek the Buddha, or the Dharma to seek the Dharma. So you students of the way should immediately refrain from conceptual thought. Let a tacit understanding be all. Any mental process must lead to error. There is just a transmission of mind with mind. This is the proper view to hold. Be careful not to look outwards to material surroundings. To mistake material surroundings for mind is to mistake a thief for your son. It is only in contradistinction to greed, anger, and ignorance that abstinence, calm, and wisdom exist. Without illusion, how could there be enlightenment? Therefore, Bodhidharma said, The Buddha enunciated all dharmas in order to eliminate every vestige of conceptual thinking. If I refrained entirely from conceptual thought, what would be the use of all the dharmas? Attach yourself to nothing beyond the pure Buddha nature, which is the original source of all things. Suppose you were to adorn the void with countless jewels. How could they remain in position? The Buddha nature is like the void. Though you were to adorn it with inestimable merit and wisdom, how could they remain there? They would, they would only serve to conceal its original nature and to render it invisible. That which is called the doctrine of mental origins, followed by certain other sects, postulates that all things are built up in mind and that they manifest themselves upon contact with external environment, ceasing to be manifest when that environment is not present. But it is wrong to conceive an environment to separate from the pure, unvarying nature of all things. That which is called the mirror of concentration and wisdom, another reference to the non-Zen Mahayana doctrine, which requires the use of sight, hearing, feeling, and cognition, which lead to successive states of calm and agitation. But these involve conceptions based on environmental objects. They are temporary expedients appertaining to one of the lower categories of roots of goodness. And this category of roots of goodness merely enables people to understand what is said to them. If you wish to experience enlightenment yourselves, you must not indulge in such conceptions. They are all environmental dharmas concerning things which are and things which are not, based on existence and non-existence. If only you will avoid concepts of existence and non-existence in regard to absolutely everything, you will then perceive the dharma. On the first day of the ninth moon, the master said to me, from the time when the great master Bodhidharma arrived in China, he spoke only of the one mind and transmitted only the one dharma. He used the Buddha to transmit the Buddha, never speaking of any other Buddha. He used the dharma to transmit the dharma, never speaking of any other dharma. That dharma was the wordless dharma, and that Buddha was the intangible Buddha, since they were in fact that pure mind which is the source of all things. This is the only truth. All else is false. Prajna is wisdom. Wisdom is the formless original mind source. Ordinary people do not seek the way, but merely indulge their six senses which lead them back into the six realms of existence. A student of the way, by allowing himself a single samsaric thought, falls among devils. If he permits himself a single thought leading to differential perception, he falls into heresy. To hold that there is something born and to try to eliminate it, that is to fall among the sravakas. To hold that things are not born but capable of destruction is to fall among the pratyekas. Nothing is born, nothing is destroyed. Away with your dualism, your likes and your dislikes, every single thing is just the one mind. When you have perceived this, you will have mounted the chariot of the Buddhas. Ordinary people all indulge in conceptual thought based on environmental phenomena, hence they feel desire and hatred. To eliminate environmental phenomena, just put an end to your conceptual thinking. When this ceases, environmental phenomena are void, and when these are void, thought ceases. 
But if you try to eliminate environment without first putting a stop to conceptual thought, you will not succeed, but merely increase its power to disturb you. Thus, all things are not but mind, intangible mind, so that what can you hope to attain? Those who are students of prajna hold that there is nothing tangible whatever, so they cease thinking of the three vehicles. There is only the one reality, neither to be realized nor attained. To say, I am able to realize something, or I am able to attain something, is to place yourself among the arrogant. The men who flapped their garments and left the meetings as mentioned in the Lotus Sutra were just such people. Therefore the Buddha said, I truly obtained nothing from enlightenment. There is just a mysterious, tacit understanding, and no more. If an ordinary man, when he is about to die, could only see the five elements of consciousness as void, the four physical elements as not constituting an I, the real mind is formless and neither coming nor going, his nature as something neither commencing at his birth nor perishing at his death, but as whole and motionless in its very depths, his mind and environmental objects is one. If he could really accomplish this, he would receive enlightenment in a flash. He would no longer be entangled by the triple world. He would be a world transcender. He would be without even the faintest tendency towards rebirth. If he should behold the glorious sight of all the Buddhas coming to welcome him, surrounded by every kind of gorgeous manifestation, he would feel no desire to approach them. If he should behold all sorts of horrific forms surrounding him, he would experience no terror. He would just be himself, oblivious of conceptual thought and one with the absolute. He would have attained the state of unconditioned being. This, then, is the fundamental principle. On the eighth day of the tenth moon, the master said to me, That which is called the city of illusion contains the two vehicles, the ten stages of a bodhisattva's progress, and the two forms of full enlightenment. All of them are powerful teachings for arousing people's interest, but they still belong to the city of illusion. That which is called the place of precious things is the real mind, the original Buddha essence, the treasure of our own real nature. These jewels cannot be measured or accumulated. Yet since they are neither Buddha nor sentient beings, neither subject nor object, where can there be a city of precious things? If you ask, well, so much for the city of illusion, but where is the place of precious things? It is a place to which no direction can be given. For if it could be pointed out, it would be a place existing in space. Hence, it could not be the real place of precious things. All we can say is that it is close by. It cannot be exactly described, but when you have a tacit understanding of its substance, it is there. Ikchantikas are those with beliefs which are incomplete. All beings within the six realms of existence, including those who follow Mahayana and Hinayana, if they do not believe in their potential Buddhahood, are accordingly called Ikchantikas, with cut-off roots of goodness. Bodhisattvas who believe deeply in the Buddha Dharma without accepting the division into Mahayana and Hinayana, but who do not realize the one nature of Buddhas and sentient beings, are accordingly called Ikchantikas with roots of goodness. Those who are enlightened largely through hearing the spoken doctrine are termed Shravakas. Those enlightened through perception of the law of karma are called Pratyeka Buddhas. Those who become Buddhas, but not from enlightenment occurring in their own minds, are called hero Buddhas. Most students of the way are enlightened through the Dharma which is taught in words and not through the Dharma of mind. Even after successive aeons of effort, they will not become attuned to the original Buddha essence. For those who are not enlightened from within their own mind, but from hearing the Dharma which is taught in words, make light of mind and attach importance to doctrine, so they advance only step by step, neglecting their original mind. Thus, if only you have a tacit understanding of mind, you will not need to search for any Dharma, for then mind is the Dharma. People are often hindered by environmental phenomena from perceiving mind and by individual events from perceiving underlying principles. So they often try to escape from environmental phenomena in order to still their minds or to obscure events in order to retain their grasp of principles. They do not realize that this is merely to obscure phenomena with mind, events with principles.
Just let your minds become void and environmental phenomena will void themselves. Let principles seek to stir and events will cease stirring of themselves. Do not employ mind in this perverted way. Many people are afraid to empty their minds lest they may plunge into the void. They do not know that their own mind is the void. The ignorant eschew phenomena, but not thought. The wise eschew thought, but not phenomena. The bodhisattva's mind is like the void, for he relinquishes everything and does not even desire to accumulate merits. There are three kinds of relinquishment. When everything inside and outside, bodily and mental, has been relinquished, when, as in the void, no attachments are left, when all action is dictated purely by place and circumstance, When subjectivity and objectivity are forgotten, that is the highest form of relinquishment. When on the one hand, the way is followed by the performance of virtuous acts, while on the other, relinquishment of merit takes place and no hope of reward is entertained, that is the medium form of relinquishment. When all sorts of virtuous actions are performed in the hope of rewards by those who nevertheless know of the void by hearing the Dharma and who are therefore unattached, that is the lowest form of relinquishment. The first is like a blazing torch held to the front which makes it impossible to mistake the path. The second is like a blazing torch held to one side, so that it is sometimes light and sometimes dark. The third is like a blazing torch held behind so that pitfalls in front are not seen. Thus the mind of the bodhisattva is like the void, and everything is relinquished by it. When thoughts of the past cannot be taken hold of, that is relinquishment of the past. When thoughts of the present cannot be taken hold of, that is relinquishment of the present. When thoughts of the future cannot be taken hold of, that is relinquishment of the future. This is called utter relinquishment of triple time. Since the Tathagata entrusted Kasyapa with the Dharma until now, mind has been transmitted with mind, and these minds have been identical. A transmission of void cannot be made through words. A transmission in concrete terms cannot be the Dharma. Thus mind is transmitted with mind, and these minds do not differ. Transmitting and receiving transmissions are both a most difficult kind of mysterious understanding, so that few indeed have been able to receive it. In fact, however, mind is not mind, and transmission is not really transmission. A Buddha has three bodies. By the Dharmakaya is meant the Dharma of the omnipresent voidness of the real self-existence, nature of everything. By the Sambhogokaya is met this dharma of the underlying universal purity of things. By the Nirmanakaya is met the dharmas of the six practices leading to nirvana and all other devices. The dharma of the Dharmakaya cannot be sought through speech or hearing or the written word. There is nothing which can be said or made evident. There is just the omnipresent voidness of the real self-existent nature of everything and no more. Therefore, saying that there is no dharma to be explained in words is called preaching the dharma. The Sambhogakaya and the Nirmanakaya both respond with appearances suited to particular circumstances. Spoken dharmas which respond to events through the senses and in all sorts of guises are none of them the real dharma. So it is said that the Sambhogakaya or the Nirmanakaya is not a real Buddha or preacher of the dharma. The term unity refers to a homogeneous spiritual brilliance which separates into six harmoniously blended elements. The homogeneous spiritual brilliance is the one mind, while the six harmoniously blended elements are the six sense organs. These six sense organs become severally united with objects that defile them. The eyes with form, the ear with sound, the nose with smell, the tongue with taste, the body with touch, and the thinking mind with entities. Between these organs and their objects arise the six sensory perceptions, making 18 sense realms in all. If you understand that these 18 realms have no objective existence, you will bind the six harmoniously blended elements into a single spiritual brilliance, a single spiritual brilliance which is the one mind. All students of the way know this, but cannot avoid forming concepts of a single spiritual brilliance and the six harmoniously blended elements. Accordingly, they are changed to entities and fail to achieve a tacit understanding of original mind. 
When the Tathagata manifested himself in this world, he wished to preach a single vehicle of truth, but people would not have believed him, and scoffing at him would have become immersed in the sea of sorrow, samsara. On the other hand, if he had said nothing at all, that would have been selfishness, and he would have not been able to diffuse knowledge of the mysterious way for the benefit of sentient beings. So he adopted the expedient of preaching that there are three vehicles, as, however, these vehicles are relatively greater and lesser, unavoidably they are shallow teachings and profound teachings, none of them being the original dharma. So it is said that there is only a one vehicle way. If there were more, they could not be real. Besides, there is absolutely no way of describing the dharma of the one mind. Therefore, the Tathagata called Kasyapa to come and sit with him on the seat of proclaiming the law, separately entrusting to him the wordless dharma of the one mind. This branchless dharma was to be separately practiced, and those who should be tacitly enlightened would arrive at the state of Buddhahood. Question and answer. What is the way, and how must it be followed? What sort of thing do you suppose the way to be, that you should wish to follow it? What instructions have the masters everywhere given for dhyana practice and the study of dharma? Words used to attract the dull of wit are not to be relied on. If those teachings were meant for the dull-witted, I have yet to hear what dharma has been taught to those of really high capacity. If they really are men of high capacity, where could they find people to follow? If they seek from within themselves, they will find nothing tangible. How much less can they find a dharma worthy of their attention elsewhere? Do not look for what is called the dharma by preachers, for what sort of dharma could that be? If that is so, should we not seek for anything at all? By conceding this, you would save yourself a lot of mental effort. But in this way, everything would be eliminated. There cannot just be nothing. Who called it nothing? Who was this fellow? But you wanted to seek for something. Since there is no need to seek, why do you also say that not everything is eliminated? Not to seek is to rest tranquil. Who told you to eliminate anything? Look at the void in front of your eyes. How can you produce it or eliminate it? If I could reach this dharma, would it be like the void? Morning and night I have explained to you that the void is both one and manifold. I said this is a temporary expedient, but you are building up concepts from it. Do you mean that we should not form concepts as human beings normally do? I have not prevented you, but concepts are related to the senses, and when feelings take place, wisdom is shut out. Then should we avoid any feeling in relation to the Dharma? Where no feelings arise, who can say that you are right? Why do you speak as though I was mistaken in all the questions I have asked your reverence? You are a man who doesn't understand what is said to him, What is all this about being mistaken? Up to now, you have refuted everything which has been said. You have done nothing to point out the true dharma to us. In the true dharma, there is no confusion, but you produce confusion by such questions. What sort of true dharma can you go seeking for? Since the confusion arises from my questions, what will your reverence's answer be? Observe things as they are, and don't pay attention to other people. There are some people just like mad dogs, barking at everything that moves, even barking when the wind stirs among the grass and leaves. Regarding this Zen doctrine of ours, since it was first transmitted, it has never taught that men should seek for learning or form concepts. Studying the way is just a figure of speech. It is a method of arousing people's interest in the early stages of their development. In fact, the way is not something which can be studied. Study leads to the retention of concepts, and so the way is entirely misunderstood. Moreover, the way is not something specially existing. It is called the Mahayana mind, mind which is not to be found inside, outside, or in the middle. Truly, it is not located anywhere. The first step is to refrain from knowledge-based concepts. This implies that if you were to follow the empirical method to the utmost limit, on reaching that limit, you would still be unable to locate mind. The way is spiritual truth and was originally without name or title. It is only because people ignorantly sought for it empirically that the Buddhas appeared and taught them to eradicate this method of approach. Fearing that no one would understand, they selected the name Way. 
You must not allow this name to lead you into forming a mental concept of a road. So it is said, when the fish is caught, we pay no more attention to the trap. When body and mind achieve spontaneity, the way is reached and mind is understood. A sramana is so called because he has penetrated to the original source of things. The fruit of attaining the sramana stage is gained by putting an end to all anxiety. It does not come from book learning. If you now set about using your minds to seek mind, listening to the teaching of others, and hoping to reach the goal through mere learning, what will you ever succeed? Some of the ancients had sharp minds. They no sooner heard the doctrine proclaimed than they hastened to discard all learning. So they were called sages, who, abandoning learning, have come to rest in spontaneity. In these days, people only seek to stuff themselves with knowledge and deductions, seeking everywhere for book knowledge and calling this dharma practice. They do not know that so much knowledge and deductions have just the contrary effect of piling up obstacles. Merely acquiring a lot of knowledge makes you like a child who gives himself indigestion by gobbling too much curds. Those who study the way according to these three vehicles are all like this. All you can call them is people who suffer from indigestion. When so-called knowledge and deductions are not digested, they become poisons, for they belong only to the plane of samsara. In the absolute, there is nothing at all of this kind. So it is said, in the armory of my sovereign, there is no sort of thusness. All the concepts you have formed in the past must be discarded and replaced by void. Where dualism ceases, there is the void of the womb of the tathagatas. The term womb of Tathagatas implies that not the smallest hair's breadth of anything can exist there. That is why the Dharma Raja, the Buddha, who broke down the notion of objective existence, manifested himself in the world. And that is why he said, When I was with Dipamkara Buddha, there was not a particle of anything for me to attain. This saying is intended just to avoid your sense-based knowledge and deductions. Only he who restrains every vestige of empiricism and ceases to rely upon anything can become a perfectly tranquil man. The canonical teachings of the three vehicles are just remedies for temporary needs. They were taught to meet such needs and so are of temporary value and differ one from another. If only this could be understood, there would be no more doubts about it. Above all, it is essential not to select some particular teaching suited to a certain occasion, and being impressed by its forming part of the written canon regarded as a mutable concept. Why so? Because in truth there is no unalterable dharma which the Tathagata could have preached. People of our sect would never argue that there could be such a thing. We just know how to put all mental activity to rest and thus achieve tranquility. We certainly do not begin by thinking out and end up in perplexity. Question and answer. From all you have just said, mind is the Buddha, but it is not clear as to what sort of mind is meant by this mind, which is the Buddha. How many minds have you got? But is the Buddha the ordinary mind or the enlightened mind? Where on earth do you keep your ordinary mind and your enlightened mind? In the teaching of the three vehicles, it is stated that there are both. Why does your reverence deny it? In the teaching of the three vehicles, it is clearly explained that the ordinary and enlightened mind are illusions. You don't understand. All this clinging to the idea of things existing is to mistake vacuity for truth. How can such conceptions not be illusory? Being illusory, they hide mind from you. If you would only rid yourselves of the concepts of ordinary and enlightened, you would find that there is no other Buddha than the Buddha in your own mind. When Bodhidharma came from the West, he just pointed out that the substance of which all men are composed is the Buddha. You people go on misunderstanding. You hold the concepts such as ordinary and enlightened, directing your thoughts outward where they gallop about like horses. All this amounts to be clouding your own minds. So I tell you, mind is the Buddha. As soon as thought or sensation arises, you fall into dualism. Beginningless time and the present moment are the same. There is no this and no that. To understand the truth is called complete and unexcelled enlightenment. Upon what doctrine does your reverence base these words? Why seek a doctrine? As soon as you have a doctrine, you fall into a dualistic thought. Just now you said the beginningless past and the present are the same. What do you mean by that? 
It is just because of your seeking that you make a difference between them. If you were to stop seeking, how could there be any difference between them? If they are not different, why did you employ separate terms for them? If you hadn't mentioned ordinary and enlightened, who would have bothered to say such things? Just as those categories have no real existence, so mind is not really mind. And as both mind and those categories are really illusions, wherever can you hope to find anything? Illusions can hide from us our own mind, but up till now you have not taught us how to get rid of illusion. The arising and the elimination of illusion are both illusory. Illusion is not something rooted in reality. It exists because of your dualistic thinking. If you will only cease to indulge in opposed concepts such as ordinary and enlightened, illusion will cease of itself. And then if you still want to destroy it, wherever it may be, you will find that there is not a hair's breadth left of anything on which to lay hold. This is the meaning of, I will let go with both hands and then I shall certainly discover the Buddha in my mind. If there is nothing on which to lay hold, how is the Dharma to be transmitted? It is a transmission of mind with mind. If mind is used for transmission, why do you say that mind too does not exist? Obtaining no dharma whatever is called mind transmission. The understanding of this mind implies no mind and no dharma. If there is no mind and no dharma, what is meant by transmission? You hear people speak of mind transmission and then you talk of something to be perceived. So Bodhidharma said, The nature of the mind when understood, no human speech can compass or disclose. Enlightenment is not to be attained and he that gains it does not say he knows. If I were to make this clear to you, I doubt if you could stand up to it. Question and answer. Surely the void stretching out in front of our eyes is objective. Then aren't you pointing to something objective and seeing mind in it? What sort of mind could I tell you to see in an objective environment? Even if I could see it, it would only be mind reflected in an objective sphere. You would be like a man looking at his face in a mirror. Though you could distinguish your features in it clearly, you would still be looking at a mere reflection. What bearing has this on the affair that brought you to me? If we do not see by means of reflections, then shall we see it all? So long as you are concerned with by means of, you will always be depending on something false. When will you ever succeed in understanding? Instead of observing those who tell you to open wide both your hands like one who has nothing to lose, you waste your strength bragging about all sorts of things. To those who understand, even reflections are nothing? If solid things do not exist, how much the less can we make use of reflections? Don't go about blabbering like a dreamer with his eyes open, like a sleepwalker. Stepping into the public hall, his reverence said, Having many sorts of knowledge cannot compare with the giving up seeking for anything, which is the best of all things. Mind is not of several kinds, and there is no doctrine which can be put into words. As there is no more to be said, the assembly is dismissed. What is meant by relative truth? What would you do with such a parasitical plant as that? Reality is perfect purity. Why base a discussion on false terms? To be absolutely without concept is called the wisdom of dispassion. Every day, whether walking, standing, sitting, or lying down, and in all your speech, remain detached from everything within the sphere of phenomena. Whether you speak or merely blink an eye, let it be done with complete dispassion. Now we are getting towards the end of the third period of 500 years since the time of the Buddha, and most students of Zen cling to all sorts of sounds and forms, why do they not copy me by letting each thought go as though it were nothing, or as though it were a piece of rotten wood, a stone, or the cold ashes of a dead fire? Or else by just making whatever slight response is suited to each occasion. If you do not act thus when you reach the end of your days here, you will be tortured by Yama. You must get away from the doctrines of existence and non-existence, for mind is like the sun, forever in the void, shining spontaneously, shining without intending to shine. This is not something which you can accomplish without effort. But when you reach this point of clinging to nothing whatever, you will be acting as the Buddha acts. This will indeed be acting in accordance with the saying, develop a mind which rests on nothing whatever. For this is your pure Dharmakaya, 
which is called Supreme Perfect Enlightenment. If you cannot understand this, though you gain profound knowledge from your studies, though you make the most painful efforts and practice the most stringent austerities, you will still fail to know your own mind. All your effort will have been misdirected and you will certainly join the family of Mara. What advantage can you gain from this sort of practice? As Qigong once said, the Buddha is really the creation of your own mind. How then can he be sought through scriptures? Though you study how to attain the three grades of bodhisattva, the four grades of sainthood, and the ten stages of a bodhisattva's progress to enlightenment until your mind is full of them, you will merely be balancing yourself between ordinary and enlightened. Not to see that all methods of following the way are ephemeral is samsaric dharma. Its strength once spent, the arrow falls to earth. You build up lives which won't fulfill your hopes. How far below the transcendental gate from which one leap will gain the Buddha's realm. It is because you are not that sort of man that you insist on a thorough study of the methods established by people of old for gaining knowledge on the conceptual level. Qigong also said, if you do not meet a transcendental teacher, you will have swallowed the Mahayana medicine in vain. If you would spend all your time walking, standing, sitting, or lying down, Learning to halt the concept-forming activities of your mind, you could be sure of ultimately attaining the goal. Since your strength is insufficient, you might not be able to transcend samsara by a single leap, but after five or ten years, you would surely have made a good beginning and be able to make further progress spontaneously. It is because you are not that sort of man that you can feel obliged to employ your mind studying jhana and studying the way. What has all that got to do with Buddhism? So it is said that all the Tathagata taught was just to convert people. It was like pretending yellow leaves are real gold just to stop the flow of a child's tears. It must by no means be regarded as though it were ultimate truth. If you take it for truth, you are no member of our sect. And what bearing can it have on your original substance? So the sutra says, what is called supreme perfect wisdom implies that there is really nothing whatever to be attained. If you are also able to understand this, you will realize that the way of the Buddhas and the way of devils are equally wide of the mark. The original, pure, glistening universe is neither square nor round, big nor small, it is without such distinctions as long and short. It is beyond attachment and activity, ignorance and enlightenment. You must see clearly that there is really nothing at all, no humans and no Buddhas, the great kiliocosms, numberless as grains of sand, are mere bubbles. All wisdom and all holiness are but streaks of lightning. None of them have the reality of mind. The Dharmakaya from ancient times until today, together with the Buddhas and patriarchs, is one. How can it lack a single hair of anything? Even if you understand this, you must make the most strenuous efforts. Throughout this life, you can never be certain of living long enough to take another breath. The sixth patriarch was illiterate. How is it that he was handed the robe which elevated him to that office? Elder Shen Xu occupied a position above 500 others and, as a teaching monk, he was able to expound 32 volumes of sutras. Why did he not receive the robe? Because he still indulged in conceptual thought, in a dharma activity. To him, as you practice, so shall you attain, was a reality. So the fifth patriarch made the transmission to Hoinam. At that very moment, the latter attained a tacit understanding and received in silence the profoundest thought of the Tathagata. That is why the Dharma was transmitted to him. You do not see that the fundamental doctrine of the Dharma is that there are no Dharmas, yet that this doctrine of no Dharma is itself a Dharma. And now that the no Dharma doctrine has been transmitted, how can the doctrine of the Dharma be a Dharma? Whoever understands the meaning of this deserves to be called a monk one skilled at dharma practice. If you do not believe this, you must explain the following story. The elder Wei Ming climbed to the summit of the Ta Yu mountain to visit the sixth patriarch. The latter asked him why he had come. Was it for the robe or for the dharma? The elder Wei Ming answered that he had not come for the robe, but only for the dharma. Whereupon the sixth patriarch said, perhaps you will concentrate your thoughts for a moment and avoid thinking in terms of good and evil. Ming did as he was told, and the sixth patriarch continued, While you are not thinking of good and not thinking of evil, just at this very moment, return to what you were before your father and mother were born. Even as the words were spoken, Ming arrived at a sudden tacit understanding. 
Accordingly, he bowed to the ground and said, I am like a man drinking water who knows in himself how cool it is. I have lived with the fifth patriarch and his disciple for thirty years, but it is only today that I am able to banish the mistakes in my former way of thinking. The sixth patriarch replied, Just so. Now at last you understand why the first patriarch arrived from India. He just pointed directly at men's minds, by which they could perceive their real nature and become Buddhas, and why he never spoke of anything besides. Have we not seen how, when Ananda asked Kasyapa what the world honored had transmitted to him in addition to the golden robe, the latter exclaimed, Ananda, and upon Ananda's respectfully answering yes, continued, throw down the flagpole at the monastery gate. Such was a sign which the first patriarch gave him. For thirty years the wise Ananda ministered to the Buddha's personal needs, but because he was too fond of acquiring knowledge, the Buddha admonished him, saying, If you pursue knowledge for a thousand days, what will avail you less than one day's proper study of the way? If you do not study it, you will be unable to digest even a single drop of water. End of part one.